Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series of lessons for July, August, and September of 2017 is on the Gospel in Galatians. This is a very challenging book, provocative in the minds of some. We think about what it accomplished in the times of the Reformation and so forth. This is lesson number four in that series for July 22 of 2017. I'd like to ask you to bow your head with us as we begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, as usual, we recognize your presence with us, asking your Holy Spirit to guide our discussion so that we may more fully comprehend the great truths that are buried in some respects here in, in, this, in this text. May we understand them better than we have, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Galatians 2, 15 to 21. And some have suggested um, that this is Paul's summary of the gospel. Um, I prefer some other sections than Paul myself, but let's just look at this real quick, see what you think. Galatians 2, 15 to 21. Indeed, we are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. That's quite a way to start out. We'll talk about that a little bit later. As they are called. Yet we know that a person is put right with God. Now I'm reading from my Good News Bible. Put right with God only through faith in Jesus Christ. Never by doing what the law requires. We too have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be put right with God through our faith in Christ and not by doing what the law requires. That's pretty clear. He's made, said that twice. For no one is put right with God by doing what the law requires. If then, as we try to be put right with God by our union with Christ, we are found to be sinners as much as the Gentiles are, does this mean that Christ is serving the cause of sin? By no means. If I start to rebuild the system of law that I tore down, then I show myself to be someone who breaks the law. So far as the law is concerned, however, I am dead killed by the law itself, in order that I might live for God. I have been put to death with Christ on his cross, so that it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. This life that I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave his life for me. I refuse to reject the grace of God, but if a person is put right with God through faith, it means that Christ died for nothing. Now, if you took those expressions one by one, every word, and tried to analyze it, you would, we'd be here for a long time. So we're going to try to take the eagle's eye view of this, see what we can learn. Well, we know that from our lesson last week that Paul starts off chapter 2 with talking about some of his personal experiences earlier. And what were these issues about? Remember, P P Peter had been exercising his freedom in Christ, setting aside his prejudices as a Jew and eating with Gentiles. But when some conservative Jewish Christians arrived from Jerusalem, what happened? He said, wait, 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 you know, I better not be eating with these Gentiles, you know. They haven't been circumcised. Wow. And so what did Paul do? He rebuked Peter openly to his face in public. Is that a good example? How many of you have heard someone stand up in church and rebuke the pastor or somebody else in church publicly? Ever seen that done in church? Well, if... if Close. I, I would... I, it wouldn't bother me as much if I knew that the rebuke was right. Wouldn't you think? Okay. If, if somebody just got up out of nowhere and started rebuking him and you don't understand why, I don't see anything wrong, then I might get a little bit... Um, perturbed by that? Perturbed. But to me, it's just like... Um, I've seen a few times in our large church here at Loma Linda that people have stood up and started saying crazy things and they get escorted out. Well, it's because they were saying crazy things, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm assuming. Crazy things, yeah. Well, it, it, it can be the spirit also that you're of. If you're, if you're you know, speaking the words in love, if you're trying to uh, 
uh, as uh, it says later in chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, you who are spiritual, you catch someone in a trespass, restore uh, them. You know, so if you're seeking to restore, uh, that's one thing. But uh, if you're just trying to make a show uh, in order to be combative, then yeah. that's, that's a different kind of spirit. Okay, here's my question. What happened at the next meal at the church in Antioch? Doesn't say, but... but <laughs> yeah. It doesn't say. Do we know, is there somewhere else in a, that says, when he says he opposed him in public, what does that mean? I mean, are Jewish we talking space. about in church? Or are we talking around the table with the other Jewish leaders? Are we... I mean, I mean in church question. is something different when you're yeah. talking to those that don't understand versus... Well, what was Paul's point in rebuking Peter like that? He wasn't just trying to spite Peter. Well, he's being... Well, my part Peter was yes. being hypocritical. He yeah. wasn't the only one, though. No, he wasn't the only one. Barnabas was drawn away, and there were many others in that group. So it was... It so was Paul is saying, we are saved by a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and whether you're circumcised or not, whether you, you know, do a whole bunch of these ceremonial things, does not make any difference. Yeah. Am I right? Do you think he was teaching that to Peter? Don't you think Peter already knew that? Well, yes, it's he a, obviously okay, wasn't but that. well, that's well, why how are you was, living? That's why well, he was referred to as being hypocritical. If he mm. truly believed, and he did believe that, then then he was, and he was living this other way. Then he, that's why he, he was called hypocritical. And that's probably why Peter doesn't sound like he said anything back. He just yeah. he probably um, said, "Yes, you're right." It, that's a pretty good difference from when we knew Peter back in the Gospels, yeah. because wasn't he part of the Sons of Thunder? No, that was James and John. James and John, yeah, that's right. But he would... He was associated with them. He, he would, was a bit outspoken himself. He was outspoken, yeah. A bit outspoken. So... Yeah, and he was also the one that uh, Jesus pointed out and said before the yes. talk through. Peter well, it's interesting that Paul here in discussing this... Now, Galatians, we don't... It was written probably in this, the fall, the, this winter of AD 57, 58, and this, uh, this in, encounter happened back about 48 or 49. So this is, he's writing about it nine or 10 years later, okay? So let's keep that in mind. In writing about it, he, he seems to be taking, he's speaking as a Jew to Jews. He talks about Gentile sinners, you know. We're the saved, we're the righteous ones, but those Gentile sinners, why do you suppose he started out talking like that? To Peter. Well, that's where they all came from, yeah. that attitude. So in other words, he, in this argument, he's not talking about Gentiles and the problems they have. No, he talks about Gentiles and the problems they have in other places. But here he's talking about the bigotry and the prejudice of Jews. So he's, he, he, wants to, he wants to speak like a Jew so they understand that he, he understands their Jewish positions and then he wants to carry them along and show them how their bigotry was wrong. Well, Jesus told the Samaritan woman that salvation is from the Jews. Mm -hmm. So there is this distinction between yeah. Jews and sinners amongst the Gentiles, there's, uh, in that sense. Well, let, let, let's, let's illustrate your point. Look at Romans 3, 1 to 3. Have the Jews then any advantage over the Gentiles? Or is there any value in being circumcised? Much indeed in every way. In the first place, God trusted his message to the Jews. But what if some of them were not faithful? Does this mean that God will not be faithful? Certainly not. God must be true even though every human being is a liar. And then he goes, launches into his discussion about sins and all that kind of stuff. Do you think so, Peter was a, was a bigot? <coughs> at what that point he, in his life? Well, at that <coughs> point that Paul was straightening them out. 
I think Peter was afraid of bigots. He was a little bit that way, he had a leaning that way, and he was afraid of the bigots who were there, had come from Jerusalem. He didn't want to lose his standing in their eyes, and in that sense, he was being a little bigoted. Well, I, th I think it's a little bit like peer pressure. How does peer yeah. pressure work? Bigotry? Well, not necessarily. It's, it's, it's that you don't want to oh, yeah. get on the bad side of these people. I mean, well, when, when kids succumb to peer pressure, what do they do? Peer pressure is we're special for in some way or other and makes us better than the rest of the people. Well, they want to be looked at as better with, with these supposed people that think they're better. So I don't think it was bigotry. I think it was, it was that peer pressure type of thing that was happening. And I, I, Paul I, could see that, and he, yeah. he got after him for it. Okay, I, I, don't, I think, don't think there's a huge difference between peer pressure and bigotry. Well, I don't, I don't know. I don't think you <laughs> have been around peer pressure like I have. Well, I mean, it's I not really. It doesn't have anything to do with racism or bigotry. Yeah, it's it's wanting to be, yeah, on the good side of somebody and and to be respected by them. Well, Peter had endured that thing before and had failed at uh, when he, the cock crew three times. And he realized uh, how far he had strayed from what he had said he was going to do. Uh, so he had given in to peer pressure before, um, but uh, mm -hmm. so he may have had, sometimes people who talk the loudest are very fragile. Yep. Uh, yeah. They're just talking big because something about them doesn't feel quite strong enough mm -hmm. inside and, and therefore they're e more easily swayed by peer pressure. There are two very important words, ideas perhaps, in this section found in Galatians 2, 16 and 17. The Greek word dikaiao, often translated justified, is found four times, and in my version it's set right or put right, is found four times in these two verses. The Greek word dikaiao is sometimes used as legal language. Sometimes it was used as legal language. It can mean to declare someone right. If a judge is doing his job properly, when he declares someone right, they truly are right. That's the whole, I mean, we don't, we don't employ judges and put them on the bench so they can declare wrong right. We hopefully, they're gonna declare right right, according to law, right? So, uh, this word can also be translated as put right or set right. The most literal translation in English would be rightify, but we, we, we don't really have a word like that. We say justify or we do something else. A similar Greek word is petrao, which is translated petrified. When we say something is petrified, does it mean that it has been declared stone or that it has really become stone? Isn't it, aren't you kind of separating things there too? Say that. What do you mean? You got a whole pile of things, of uh, uh, people right here. Mm -hmm. You got a corral here. You got a corral here. Mm -hmm. You got to make a judgment. Who goes into this corral and this corral? Okay. So, as you're doing your judgment, you're actually separating the people out, so to speak. Okay, but the question is, who does the separating? Is it the people themselves, or is it God who does it? Well, I'm just talking about judgment because you just okay. talked about a judge mm -hmm. in yeah, general. But, uh, why is there a corral over here and one over here? Is this Why is there sin over here and righteousness over here? Right, so how do you know uh, that this rock or whatever you're using as a token goes over here or over there? That's well, the judgment. you don't declare it. You don't right. declare this guy over here, you don't declare this guy over here unless you've, you've got a reason to do it. Right. God doesn't make any mistakes in his judgment. And the words he has spoken will be your judge. Mm -hmm. But people have to agree with it, right? I mean, well, hopefully, you know, you know, hopefully well, that really that they'll understand his his well, judgment. The bottom, why he's doing it, isn't it, that what yeah. what the whole thing's about? If you believe in John three and John twelve, it basically says we judge ourselves right. by the way we respond to God's word. We judge ourselves. Okay, I judge myself guilty. Then what? 
Well, I then you go. Righteous. Then you become a sinner. Then you are a sinner. Then you are. A you sinner. remain a sinner. And then, if you, if you no. reject the light, then you have brought judgment on yourself. Yeah. Already, because you are in darkness. If you seek the light, then you are walking so, in the light. So here's 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 the issue. And you know this, but so let's be very clear so that our audience understands and we all understand. Out of our Protestant Reformation came the idea that the only ultimate requirement for salvation is justification. And justification to the Protestant Reformers meant forgiveness. They were so concerned about their past sins, they were just sure that all those past sins were going to lead them straight into hellfire. So they thought if they could be forgiven by God, that's all that would need to happen. The rest, who knows? Well, so they came up with this idea that justification means for God to declare you right. That is, to forgive you. Now, is that enough? Is that all that we have to do? All, all, everybody's forgiven. It's, but the problem is not everybody want to be healed. Mm -hmm. If sin is a disease, forgiveness does not solve your problem. What you need is healing, which it means to heal your thinking, the way you think about God, so that you can learn the words that he has spoken, which is spirit and life, John 6, 63. Mm -hmm. Well, Paul makes it very clear in Galatians and elsewhere in his writings that we can never be declared righteous or set right or put right by observing the law. Why is that? always fall short. We could be put right with God if we could keep the law. The Bible actually says that. Leviticus 18.5, look at this verse. Obey my laws and do what I command. I am the Lord your God. And he's just saying that's what you need to do. And, okay, and we come over to the New Testament, Romans 2.13. For it is not by hearing the law that people are put right with God, but by doing what the law commands. Doesn't that sound like if you could just do what the law commands, you'd be put right? And if the law is a commandment, or is it descriptive, or, and is it prescriptive, mm -hmm. as opposed to proscriptive, uh, it's a prescription. And if you don't want to f take the this prescription, you're free to mess up and, and go your own no. self-centered way. The description a description? Yes. Here's the, the law is a description of the way all intelligent creatures will conduct themselves for eternity. It's a description, but it's also a prescription. Something that is not proscription, don't do this, don't do that. No, it's a description of the way things work. Okay, let's let's yeah, Unpack and that. I agree with that. But let's let's I want I want to nail this down because mm -hmm. I can remember how, what I was taught when I was young. Everybody in the church seemed to believe this. They thought we were supposed to believe that. Imputed and imparted. And There's all, all that kind of stuff. Um, remember that the word sometimes translated justify literally means to be made righteous. Is that possible? Now I was taught when I was young that when I sin. Something gets written on a blackboard up there in heaven. And I need to make sure I get down on my knees at night or maybe in the morning and ask God to forgive my sins. And then he'll wipe all those sins out. And then when he comes along on judgment day, if that, that slate is clean, I'm home free. And that's a focus completely in the wrong direction. Because if we're all focusing on what we've, the sins we've committed in the past, we just become more and more sinful. We need to focus on Jesus and where he's going. The past is unchangeable. It's a permanent part of the record now. We can't change it. Now, it doesn't mean we shouldn't ask for forgiveness, but we ask for forgiveness because we want to change. We want to do something different in the future. Why don't we pray that we thank God for being the way he is, and that is being forgiving. We don't need to beg for forgiveness because that's the way God is. Well, is forgiving. Here's another side to that question. It's very interesting that a man by the name of Peter Abelard, of course, this was he lived between 1079 and 1142 A.D. a long time ago, and of course, obviously, at that point in time, he was a part of the Catholic Church. He wrote a book entitled Cordeus Homo 
or in other words, why did God become man? He raised the question which evangelical Christians have still not resolved. He wrote, For what justice is there in giving up the most just or righteous man of all to death on behalf of the sinner? What man would not be judged worthy of condemnation if he condemned the innocent in order to free the guilty? I mean, how would we feel about a judge who was, to, who was letting all the, the criminals go free and, and condemning the, the good people? For if he could, now this is thinking, think about God now as a judge, if he could not save sinners except by condemning the just or the righteous one, where is his omnipotence? But if he could, but would not, how we defend his wisdom and justice? Do you follow the argument? So how do we respond to that? Well, well he's just, isn't he just asking that, that I mean, how can you make all that currency so you can pass it around and then have enough of the currency to be saved? You mean the merits of Christ you're talking about or what? Well, he's, it seems like he's talking about how can you, how can you switch all this stuff around? Well, he's... he's pass it around. He's, what he, what, what he's saying is this. We say that God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. Okay. Mm -hmm. If he's all-powerful, can't he forgive? Why can't he just forgive everybody and save everybody? Two different things. Okay. But he's, he's, he forgives everybody, uh -huh. but not everybody wants to be healed. Yeah. Which is the way you think about God. And mm -hmm. if you don't not in, think like God or like, think like Jesus, God can't force you to do anything at all. Yeah. Okay. I thought he was kind of dealing with the, the price, paying the price type yeah. of thing. How can you possibly do that? Okay, and, and how does that relate to our salvation? That's the question. Well, maybe it doesn't. Maybe that's uh, it's starting with wrong assumptions and instead of seeing it from a totally different angle, if uh, we, in Adam we all die in Christ we are made alive. Uh, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So mm -hmm. uh, it's not so much that he's paying some kind of penalty as that uh, we are in him in a sense and we die to self and uh, that uh, in order for, uh, for us to live we had, uh, he had to go the, through the process first. Mm -hmm. uh, to die and raise on the other side. So uh, Do, okay, let, let's let's break this down a little bit. And you, you've made some good points. Do we believe that God can save sinners? Can't force it on them. Uh, yes. He can he, keep he, them he alive. Can. Is that what you're saying? He's doing it right now, isn't he? Right. Yeah. yeah. But okay. they have to come to repentance once. He wants all to be saved. And what does the repentance. repentance have to do with the death of Jesus? Accepting uh, his life. Uh, rejecting uh, my life. You know, I, I have to consider myself as dead and uh, alive to God in Christ. Mm -hmm. Dying to self. We're using, <laughs> those are we're using metaphors to tell, explain other metaphors. Though. Well, kinda... <laughs> there's no other way to do it. <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, Maybe there is. We just haven't hit it yet. <laughs> okay, well, the second question that comes up as we discuss this in Paul's context is what kind of law? He says you can't do anything by works of the law. Is that by keeping the Ten Commandments? Is that by keeping the ceremonial law? Is it both? What's he talking about? Any of those things. Uh, Remember that quotation from uh, Great Controversy, what, page 555? Yeah, I've got it down here. It's the law of human nature, you become like the person or thing that you worship or admire. And if you're not attracted to God and the, and the way he is in, gave the instruction, what can he do to you? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if we are so free, but and we can stay within his sphere of protection. However, take Paul and Jesus and Peter and John the Baptist and many others. 
Even, even they died. Here's an interesting comment from um, our Sabbath school Bible study guide. Although the phrase works of the law does not occur in the Old Testament and is not found in the New Testament outside of Paul, stunning confirmation of its meaning emerged in 1947 with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, a collection of writings copied by a group of Jews called Essenes who lived at the time of Jesus. Although written in Hebrew, one of the scrolls contains this exact phrase. The scroll's title is Mixat Mas HaTorah, which can be translated Important Works of the Law. The scroll describes a number of issues based on biblical law concerning, concerned with preventing holy things from being made impure, including several that mark the Jews out as separate from the Gentiles. At the end, the author writes that if these works of the law are followed, you will be reckoned righteous before God. Unlike Paul, the author does not offer his reader righteousness on the basis of faith, but on the basis of behavior. So is that what the works of the law are? If there's no behavior, is there, is there any faith? Yeah. I mean, believing something that, that ain't so, that's, that's that old Catholic, Catholic yeah. doctrine. Is there if such it, thing as works of God? Can you yeah. do works of God? Yeah. Well, he well, behaves like, isn't the, like, the, isn't the like law Jesus did. a reflection of God's character? Yes. Huh. So when you're doing the works of God, you're doing the works of the law. Should be. Should be, but I'm not what, quite what, sure. What as is faith? Means, I mean, as, as a me, if you're doing those in order to get something, that's, that's yeah. not going to get there. Either you're, you're already there mm -hmm. in a right relationship with God, and then you do these things out of that relationship, but not doing those things in order to get the relationship. Yeah, I see that. I see that. Look at, look at Acts 16.31. Very interesting passage. Then, now this is right after the earthquake. Paul and Silas are in the Philippian prison. They have been released by the earthquake. The jailer is about to kill himself because uh, he knows that he's responsible for these prisoners. And now it looks like they're all going to escape. And, and he rushes in to find out what's going on. And Paul says, well, hold it. We're all here. Don't panic. And so the jailer says, what must I do to be saved? And they answered. <laughs> here's the verse. They answered, believe or have faith in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your family. Isn't that the gospel just in a few words? What yep. does that mean? Well, that's what I'm asking you. What does that mean? Read it again. Those okay. words. His words, Acts 16, 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your family. I mean, and believe, believe is the same word as... actually had existed. Believe that he actually is real. Believe yeah. that he, you know, there's a yeah, lot of people save saying you. he wasn't real. Mm -hmm. So... If, if you believe in that and you look towards him, that's the beginning of wisdom right there. So you're starting your, your trail up uh, to, to being godlike. Yeah. You're starting there. That's your good starting point, right? Yeah. There is no other uh, starting point. A lot of people, if you ask them what, is, what faith is, they turn to Hebrews 11.1. 1. And we, we call Hebrews 11 the faith chapter because it's by faith he did this, by faith he did this, and so forth. But actually, without we don't have time to discuss that right now. Hebrews 11.1 1 talks about what faith does. It doesn't talk about what faith is. So I'm going to tell you what I think is the best definition of faith that I've ever seen, yes? Well, there's some, some words that are used in English that are, come from the, yeah. that are the same word. Yeah, you know, there's belief. faith, belief, trust, and confidence. Yeah. And faith, belief, trust. They're all translated from the same word in Greek. And this is, the, this is uh, my mentor, Dr. A. Graham Maxwell. Spent a lot of time working on this definition. This is what he often quoted in his classes. Faith is just a word we use to describe a relationship with God as with a person well known. By the way, if you would like this information, it's available on our website at theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. 
So faith is just a word we use to describe a relationship with God as with a person well known. The better we know him, the better the relationship may be. We cannot say will be because we remember the story of Lucifer. Faith implies an attitude toward God of love, trust, and deepest admiration. It means having enough confidence, there's that word again, in God based on the more than adequate evidence revealed to be willing to believe what he says as soon as we're sure he's the one saying it, to accept what he offers as soon as we're sure he's the one offering it, uh, and to do what he wishes as soon as we are sure he's the one wishing it, without reservation for the rest of eternity. Anyone who has such faith would be perfectly safe to save. This is why faith is the only requirement for heaven. But that's not the end. Faith also means that, like Abraham, remember Genesis 18, Job, remember Job 42, 7 and 8, and Moses, remember Exodus 32 and Numbers 14, God's friends, we know God well enough to reverently ask him why. So faith doesn't mean that you don't ask why. Faith means if you really know God, you ask why. If you don't have the questions, you won't see the answers. That's right. So being justified or put right or set right in God's eyes is more than just a way of dealing with our past sins. What would be the purpose of setting someone right or putting him right if he just continued doing the evil things that he'd been doing? I've, in our previous lesson, I suggested, you know, if we just get forgiven so we can go out, go out and do the same sin over again, I mean, that's like an indulgence. It is by beholding that we become changed, 2 Corinthians 3.18. And now I'm going to read the, probably one of the best statements about that by Ellen White, found in Great Controversy, page 555, paragraph 1. It is a law. When we say it is a law, what do we mean? It's how things work. It's how things work. There are no variations to this. There's no exceptions to it. It is a law, both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature, that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated to that which it is accustomed to love and reverence. Man will never rise higher than his standard of purity or goodness or truth. If self is his loftiest ideal, he will never attain to anything more exalted. Rather, he will constantly sink lower and lower. The grace of God alone has power to exalt man. Left to himself, his course must inevitably be downward. Great Controversy, page 555. So how do we behold God? Study. Study Take what? instruction. Well, about the only... The, the Bible, and fortunately we have the uh, writings of Ellen White to contribute to it but and help explain things. But uh, if you're unwilling to spend some time studying, <laughs> I don't know what God can do to you, or for you, rather. Romans ten seventeen. So then faith comes from hearing the message, and the message comes through preaching Christ. Or some versions say preaching about God. So... And some of his attributes are present in nature, as it says in Romans 1. His eternal power and things are self-evident. Uh, so there are things in nature that we could see. Yeah. Uh, well, it's through his inspired word, through his books, not only the book of, of the Bible, but the book of nature, as you suggested, that we get to know him, to appreciate him, and to love him, and to worship him. Could we lose our faith? Well, we believe that developing the right faith relationship with God is a lifelong experience. God's warning in Genesis 2.17 that sin leads to death was answered by the life and especially the death of Jesus. The truth of that was demonstrated by the death of Jesus. The life and death of Jesus gives us a choice. We can choose to become more like him and thus live lives as close as possible to his life, or we will die as he died, the second death, the result of sin or final separation from God. And you remember, you want to know why Jesus died? Remember Matthew 27, 46. At about three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud shout, Eli, Eli, lama which means, My God, my God, 
Why did you abandon me? So what happens when the final showdown comes and God has to deal with sin? Those who separate themselves from God are, de are declaring their own demise, basically. Well, Paul's Judaizing opponents were trying to convince the Galatians that they would not be saved by faith alone, but rather by faith, by faith plus a certain amount of works. Obviously, Paul was adamantly opposed to that approach. As a former Pharisee of the Pharisees, he certainly should have known. <laughs> I mean, think about what the Pharisees are known for. So yes. Paul had previously said, yeah, I, I do it by my works. I'm saved because I'm a Jew and I work at it. Yep. So faith is not just a legal claim by which we are granted the legal status of Jesus our Savior. <clears throat> faith is a relationship with God as with a person well known as stated above in item number 14. By beholding the life of Jesus and loving what we see, we become changed bit by bit, step by step, into his image. In other words, faith has as its primary goal not the eradication of our previous sinful records, which is impossible anyway, but the living of a new life in relationship to Jesus Christ. And what do we know about the eradication of records? Well, look at Ephesians I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14. God is going to judge everything we do, whether good or bad, even things done in secret. Does that sound like God has a record of all things? It does, doesn't it? Look at Revelation 20, verses 12 and 13. And I saw the dead, great and small alike, standing before the throne. Books were opened, and then another book was opened, the book of the living. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Then the sea gave up its dead, death and the world of the dead also gave up the dead they held, and all were judged according to what they had done. Does God have a record? You bet he does. I've got one here, uh, John uh, 8, 48. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, uh, 12, 48, I'm sorry. Yeah. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has a judge. The word that I have spoken will be his judge on the last day. So if you don't want to listen to his instruction, he will let you go. If, right? Okay, let me, let me bring you a test case. What about the thief on the cross? How well, much there were good, two of them, apparently. How many good works did he do? We're talking about the one who repented. But he listened to, uh, to Jesus, mm -hmm. and he liked what he saw and what he heard. And uh, Jesus, I guess he had enough insight into his character that he could declare that in the future he would be with Jesus in paradise. And he did with Job, he had a lot longer time dealing with, dealing with Job, but God declared Job righteous. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think uh, God's judgment is, is uh, pretty accurate, or is accurate. Yeah. We don't have to waffle on it. He is God as accurate. Well, uh, read Job 1 and Job 42. There yeah, you have it. Yeah. And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as right, righteousness. So when we respond to the, the drawings of the Holy Spirit uh, and uh, accept and submit to those drawings, mm -hmm. then uh, the life, new life begins, eternal life begins. And that's, I think, what happened to the Philippian jailer and, mm -hmm. and the thief on the cross. That was the beginning of life eternal for them. Yeah. It happened through faith. So our lives can be transformed by the actions of the Holy Spirit through a lifelong, continuing relationship with Jesus Christ. Are we learning day by day how to live more Christ-like lives? We talk about the Spirit, the Spirit, uh, uh, the Spirit of Truth, and the Truth will set you free. Mm -hmm. Simple. Yeah. Children become like their parents by their association with them. So we can become like our heavenly parents by a closer association with them. I, um, and I'm sure, Gordon, you probably remember this. I had a professor who was a radiologist in medical school. And in the early days of radiology, they didn't realize how potentially dangerous it was. 
and this man had done a lot of work with his arm in the, in the direct radi rays of the x-ray machine and so forth, and he developed cancer in his, up, uh, in his humerus here, upper, upper arm. So he had to have his arm cut off at the, at the shoulder. And so he learned how to do a lot of things with one hand. And guess what his children did? They did a lot of things with one hand that we would normally use two hands for. But they, they just saw their father doing it that way, and so they did it that way. <clears throat> Not everything, but of course they did. That's what happens. By beholding, we become changed. The Holy Spirit actually works with us to transform our lives. One of the great examples of faith, and we all know about this, in the Bible is Abraham. Abraham lived about two, around 2,000 years before Christ. He is the first character in the Bible whose life is spelled out in considerable detail. There are many ups and downs we know in the life of Abraham, but over the years, Abraham d developed a very close personal relationship with Jesus, who was the God of the Old Testament. How do we know Jesus was the God of the Old Testament? Well, we often quote 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4, which is an excellent verse, excellent passage, but I like Matthew 24, 44. This is Jesus. 24. 44, did I say? Luke 24, not Matthew. I'm sorry, Luke 24, 44. Jesus speaking to the disciples, then he said to them, these are the very things I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written about me in the law of Moses, What's the law of Moses? First five books. The first five books of the Old Testament. The writings of the prophets and the Psalms, that's talking about the entire Old Testament, had to come true. So Jesus is saying all those stories in the Old Testament, they're about me. Finally, in that terrible test we all know about, Abraham got a vision in the night, said, take your son, go three days' journey to Mount Moriah, and offer there, him there as a sacrifice. Ellen White says he didn't sleep a, a wink that was a whole period of time. He's praying to God, God, why are you asking me to do this? What, what, what could possibly be the reason? And Hebrew suggests, and Ellen White confirms, that he finally came to the conclusion that God would either raise Isaac back from the dead or he would provide a substitute. And of course, we know what happened. Provided a substitute. Ram caught in the He's thicket. just ready to let that knife fall on his son and, and take away his life. And God held his hand and said, No, Abraham, now we know that you trust God. And there was a ram caught in the thicket. He, would, he uh, sacrificed that, that ram. Well, Patriarchs and Prophets 154 and 155 give these words, which I think are very significant. The sacrifice required of Abraham was not alone for his own good, not solely for the benefit of the seeding generations, but it was also for the instruction of the sinless intelligences of heaven and of other worlds. Now, I'm going to ask you some questions as we go along here. What could the sinless intelligences of the other worlds possibly learn from this experience? What not to do. What not to do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, anything else they can learn <laughs> from this experience? That fallen human beings can change and act on faith in God mm -hmm. and trust Him. Did they have any questions about the character of Abraham? Well, we do from reading, <laughs> reading about it. And they probably saw more than we. They we saw see. it. They saw it happen. But weren't they learning about the character of God from this? I was about to ask you that. Yes. Reading on the field of the controversy between Christ and Satan, the field in which the plan of redemption is wrought out, is the lesson book of the universe. Where's that? Where did that happen? That's not a trick question. What's the theater of the universe? Right it's right here. Where do we get that in the Bible? 1 Corinthians 4.9. 1 Corinthians 4.9. We are the theater of the universe. Because Everybody is an actor. We all are actors, whether we like it or not. Because Abraham had shown a lack of faith in God's promises, Satan had accused him before the angels and before God of having failed to comply with the conditions of the covenant. 
and as unworthy of its blessings. God desired to prove that loyalty, the loyalty of his servant before all heaven to demonstrate that nothing less than perfect obedience can be accepted and open more fully before them the plan of salvation. Do they have some questions about Abraham's perfect obedience? Do we have you any evidence? You keep point, pointing to us, but I think, I think it was pointing back to them, too. To who, the angels? The angels, because they, they've gone through all the, the war in heaven. Yeah. And so they've, I mean, it, it's, it's, whether somebody's saved or not isn't up to the angels, it's up to God. And they have faith in that. Mm -hmm. I don't really think that. But what about Abraham? Do we have any evidences that he made some mistakes along the way? Lots of them. Yeah. Yeah. But how does that make God look? Doesn't that look, if we learn more about God, he's far more gracious than uh, preacher types and mm -hmm. theologians have made him out to be? Well, what do you think Satan was doing touring the heavens every time Satan make a bit, I mean, every time Abraham did, did a big boo-boo? I'm sure he was touring around there, and, and, and I'll read it to you in just a moment from Ellen White here, saying, okay, these are the kind of people that God calls his friends. What do you think of that? And he'd say, Lying and cheating. He'd say God wasn't being fair. Yeah. Look, look, he was mis mistreating Satan and his minions, and God's not fair by forgiving and uh, making friends with Abraham yeah. and Job and so on and so forth. Reading on, heavenly beings were witnesses of the scene as the faith of Abraham and the submission of Isaac were tested. The trial was far more severe than that which had been brought upon Adam. Compliance with the prohibition laid upon our first parents involved no suffering, but the command to Abraham demanded the most agonizing sacrifice. All heaven beheld with wonder and admiration Abraham's unfaltering obedience. All heaven applauded his fidelity. Satan's accusations were shown to be false. What's going on here? Who's being shown right and who's being shown wrong? God's being shown to be right. Satan wrong. You mean something we could do here on this earth might have some impact on the great controversy in the, in the universe? That's what it says. What, what was right that God showed? God, it was, what was right about what God showed is he called Abraham his friend and he said, I can trust Abraham. But what does that have to do with, what does that have to do with sacrificing his son? Well, God says, watch, whether or not Abraham will be really, when it comes down, when the rubber really meets the road, will Abraham follow what I tell him to so do? So it is behavior. That's one of the questions we're asking here. Yep. So it, if it is behavior... And, and the Bible says very clearly, Abraham was justified by this behavior, yes. Okay, so is that what's going to... Is that going to be what, part of the thing that's going to save all of us? Because well, what Abraham is, was able to pull off that behavior? What does James say? You remember what it says? one thirteen. God says he tempts no one and God cannot be tempted. Mm -hmm. So how do we put that so in how there? That, how, <laughs> how does that fit that, that together? That's pretty tough. But I, 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 I want to go to James 2. Hold on here just a second. Oh, was Abraham doing it? What was his motivation for doing that? Well, so still, it, it sounds like everybody's oohing and aahing that he pulled it off. Like he, he did the right thing. The culture so that he, Abraham came out yeah. of was a very pagan culture from the standpoint if you the greatest thing you could do to your for your deity was to offer your firstborn but uh, what um, so he had to prove that, um, well, that God's well, followers are just as is as loyal let me let so me let me read you it this is James chapter 2 I'm going to start reading from verse 14. My brothers and sisters, what good is it for people to say that they have faith if their actions do not prove it? Can that faith save them? Suppose there are brothers and sisters who need clothes and don't have enough to eat. What good is there in, their, in your saying to them, God bless you, keep warm and eat well, if you don't give them the necessities of life? So it is with faith. If it is alone and includes no actions, 
then it is dead. But someone may, will say, one person has faith and there has actions. My answer is, show me how anyone can have faith without actions, I will show you my faith by my actions. Do you believe that there's only one God? Good. The demons also believe and tremble with fear. You fool, you, do you want to show, be shown that faith without actions is useless? How was our ancestor Abraham put right with God? How about putting uh, Michael? It was through his actions. So, when he so, offered his son on the altar. So behavior does test whether you have faith or not. It does. How about no, putting, no, 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 no. Put in Micah 6, 6 through 8 there. Mm -hmm. that, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with bird offerings, with calves a year of old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is right and good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. But he didn't say sacrifice your son. That's right. He doesn't want that. He never has wanted that. He never wanted it. No. So why is it such a test it's for a the pagan whole concept. universe? It's so you don't think th that, that God actually spoke to Abraham and asked him to do that? Well, he th um, Abraham thought he did. And, I, and I've read, we got it here in, in Hebrews, and we got Ellen White says it, but they... Well, God did that. No, I think and, and he, he did. did do and that. let me let me finish reading what I. I mean, it says right here. It was through his actions when he offered his. This is right out of the Bible. It was through his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. Can't you see his faith and his actions worked together? His faith was made perfect through his actions. Now let's go back and finish reading what Ellen White said. God declared his servant. Now I know. Declared to his servant. Now I know that thou fearest God. That's. That's what you were supposed to do in Old Testament God, time, to fear God, to reference God. Notwithstanding Satan's charges, notice that, seeing that thou, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Genesis 22, 12. God's covenant confirmed to Abraham by an oath before the intelligence of other worlds testified that obedience will be rewarded. It had been difficult even for the angels to grasp the mystery of redemption to comprehend that the commander of heaven, the Son of God, must die for guilty man. When the command was given to Abraham to offer up his son, the, inter the interest of all heavenly beings was enlisted. With intense earnestness, they watched each step in the fulfillment of this command. When to Isaac's question, where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham made answer, God will provide himself a lamb. And when his father's hand was stayed as he about to slay his son, and the ram which had God had provided was offered in the place of Isaac, then light was shed upon the mystery of redemption, and even the angels understood more clearly the wonderful provision that God had made for man's salvation. 1 Peter 1, verse 12. What, how do we put Deuteronomy 18 and 10? Yeah. Therefore shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering. And so, so on and so forth. So how do we get to be friends of God? Are we declared that way? Or do we become friends of God by being transformed by our faith relationship with Jesus Christ? I mean, look at the, the people that in the Bible that God calls his friends. Job, Abraham, Moses in the Old Testament. Every one of them had conversations with God in which they challenged God. Why are you doing this? But none of them had to sacrifice their son or go through the motions of it. Well, Abra Job didn't have any choice. He, he lost all his children, all well, ten of them. Lots of people lose their children. But to actually have God command uh -huh. um, Abraham to go do that, he's the only one. Yeah. The only one, you can't even compare anybody else yeah. to that. So when it comes to friendship, I don't know if the friendship, if, the, if that's exactly the test or not, because, because these other friends didn't have to go through yeah. that. Abraham demonstrated his trust in God. God says that all who fully trust him, as Abraham did, will receive eternal life. That's what the Bible says. How does that work? Do we somehow magically benefit from what Christ did? Or is it that we benefit because we have come to understand why he died and what that means for our salvation? Does understanding Jesus make us want to love him more? 
circumcision or lack of circumcision, being a Jew or being a Gentile, being a slave or being free, being male or being female, are not the issues. These things make no difference. That's what Paul says. Genuine faith is a response to God. It is not something that we do, a feeling or an attitude, apart from God's reaching out to us. So what does faith actually do for us? It sets us free. How does that work? What does that mean? Our sins no longer matter. We are led to believe and obey, thus we are changed. Our faith is not like the faith of demons which does not change them. It is essential, if you come to think about it carefully, that we come to have as complete and correct a picture of God, His character, and His government as is possible. If we are going to be changed by our picture of God, we need to have a good picture. No wonder Satan has done everything possible down through the generations to distort the picture of God. He wants us to believe that God is arbitrary, exacting, vengeful, unforgiving, and severe. He calls God a tyrant. We believe that Christ was sinless throughout his entire life. Does that mean that he kept the law perfectly? If so, and I believe that, does, he record, does his record of perfect obedience get transferred to our account? How does that work? Is it because our obedience is so patchy that Christ's obedience works and ours doesn't? That's paganism. That's is the transfer of Christ's righteousness not just a legal exchange? <clears throat> if we believe that God simply declares us righteous by justifying us, and if this process happens over and over and over again with little or no change in us, some people would suggest that this is an encouragement for people to sin. Romans 3 8 and 6 1. After all, if God takes care of everything without a per person having to make any change in his or her life, then it does not matter. It does not matter how one lives. Well, this is not heavenly make believe. There is real change, and God really wants us to be his children. He offers this free to us. In other words, the, the story is there, the evidence is there. How are we going to respond to? Respond to it. Uh, God calls us to look at the life of Jesus, to open our lives to the Holy Spirit, to be changed and transformed by that relationship so that we can become more and more like Him. That's His challenge to all of us. Our kind and loving Father, what a wonderful privilege we have had to have opened before us the records of these saints of yours who lived so many years ago. We are, we've looked at Paul, we've looked at Peter, and we've looked at Abraham. May their experiences teach us something about your love and your kindness and the kind of relationship you want to have with us. May we have faith as we have read it described here in this lesson as our prayer in Jesus' name.